Hello and welcome to Westman This Week for Thursday, April 27th. I'm Nicole Ruth and here are some of the stories we are covering today. The college term is winding down as student stress is winding up during exams. It is Vaccination Awareness Week. We will be hearing you on the latest in COVID boosters. And this weekend, you can hear the sounds of music in the aisles of the Westman Centennial Auditorium. We'll have all those stories and more on Westman This Week. Thanks for tuning in. The college semester is winding down, which means it's exam time. And that means a lot of stress for students across Manitoba. Drake Forrester has more. This is Danielle Bossert, a business student here at ACC. She, among many others, is starting to feel the pressures of final exam season. Exam week this week, so I've written some exams. I've got a couple more before I'm done. Some pretty big final projects. Uh, I have a 90 page um, group assignment due, and it's just been quite a bit. I spoke to Chris Hunt, a student success advisor here at ACC, about mental health in students. I think it just time moves on. We move away from the stigma. We better understand uh, what it's like um, to face these barriers. We have a lot of role models who are putting themselves out there to explain that it's something they experience. We have more information about how it really is another health concern, just like anything else, broken bones or other conditions. Mental health is no different. I think we're starting to recognize that more and more. Folks who are going to college right now are a lot more open to talk about what they're experiencing, emotions, seek help, and I think that's a great thing. After speaking to Chris, I was curious, what do students do to keep down on stress? And do they have support systems? I try to make sure that my days aren't too full. Like if you pack too much in one day, then you're gonna get stressed. And I try to I try to rationalize that I have more time than I'm giving myself because that can stress me out if I think I'm on too tight of a time constraint. Um, I have some stress toys that I usually fiddle with when I get too stressed or cry. I have a therapist that I talk to regularly and I talk to my mom and everything. So they're really good. My family's really understanding of stress that runs in my family. I'm lucky to have them. They're really great. No story about stress is complete without supplying some health tips. Number one, take care of yourself. Eat healthy, exercise, get plenty of sleep. Give yourself a break if you feel stressed out. Take care of your body. Take deep breaths, stretch, meditate. Make time to unwind. Do activities that you enjoy. Talk to others. Talk to people that you could trust about your concerns or how you feel. Take breaks from social media. It's good to be informed about things, but sometimes too much is too much. If you go through anxiety, mental stress, or simply need someone to talk to, ACC offers a number of helplines if you need them. For Westman This Week, I'm Drake Forster. Two years after the major push for COVID vaccinations, officials are now saying that boosters are no longer always necessary. Here is Katrina Spangler with the details. It's National Immunization Awareness Week, and the Manitoba government is reminding Manitobans to catch up with confidence and get their latest vaccine updates. But what about COVID boosters? The typical time to get a booster is 6 to 12 months after your last one, but the latest recommendations from international governments are saying that unless you're immunocompromised, pregnant or elderly, that you won't need a booster again for some time. And boosters are important for anyone who's still at risk of getting seriously ill from COVID. Here was what Manitoba's Chief Medical Officer Brent Rusin had to say about getting your spring booster COVID shot. I say this spring, it's, it's going to be, uh, you know, the, the highest risk individuals. So certainly if you haven't had a, a primary series, I still recommend anyone get that primary series. Um, but if you've been uh, vaccinated up to now, um, you've had your uh, prior uh, booster dose, uh, you uh, should consider a, a spring booster uh, if you are uh, over the age of 65, if you have severe medical problems, uh, if you're immune compromised. 
Uh, and of course, you can discuss that with any of your uh, healthcare providers. The age range recommendations are that high-risk Canadians receive booster shots this spring, including all adults 80 years of age and older, adults 65 to 79 years old, especially if they've never been infected with COVID-19, and people eight, over 18 who are moderately to severely immunocompromised due to an underlying condition or ongoing treatment. It's up to you to decide whether or not you'll get your next COVID booster, but the recommendations for elderly and immunocompromised people should be followed closely. For Westman This Week, I'm Katrina Spangler. A Native Studies professor at Brandon University is hopeful that Anishinaabe Moan language classes will take off. The classes will take place at the BU Indigenous Cultural Centre. They will be free to anyone who wishes to take part and learn. For me, doing this here at the Brandon is, I hope, to um, encourage learners to learn the language. I also hope that, you know, people will follow or at least uh, I can help them um, create their groups as well too. Like, uh, I've been wanting to learn Anishinaabemowin actually for a couple of years and uh, I'd sure like a group like that. So if anybody wants to start one, I'm willing to help out in that. And, uh, and I think we're going to be doing that uh, with ourselves and Julia as well too. I've been talking to her. The City of Brandon has just released the final draft of its Climate Change Action Plan. The plan includes several items on how the city plans to improve the environment and meet climate targets. Our Jonah Kopecki has more. Madeline Robinson is a part of the group called Sustainable Brandon. This group is hoping to work with the City of Brandon to find solutions to a healthier environment in Brandon. Madeline believes that if they can create more sustainable transport options, then that will help reduce carbon emissions. Then that creates obviously more carbon, as well as not as nice a neighborhood. So Sustainable Brandon will be pushing for and helping the city to achieve that particular strategy. Sean Cameron is a city councillor in the city of Brandon and he believes that there are many ways for Brandon to be greener. That's, you know, ensuring that we're increasing transit, whether we're looking at electrified options for transit, whether we're looking at expanding our green cart program, whether we're looking at, you know, ways in which that we improve, um, you know, our, our whole watershed district. Climate change is going to be an impact on all those decisions. The City Council recognizes that this is a long process and that change won't happen overnight. Jonah Kopecki. Brandon. The worsening civil war in Sudan is now causing concern right here at home. The conflict has Sudanese Canadians fearing for the safety of their loved ones. Oliwai Coyote Atikin met up with a Brandon man whose family is trapped by the violence. Sunday Fanji is among those waiting for news about his family in war zone Khartoum. Since this war started, I can tell you I barely sleep. South of Khartoum, where my, my sisters were living, where our, our home is, was bombed yesterday. And my aunt is still there. We don't know. Two generals are battling for control and hundreds of civilians have been killed. Canada has only so far evacuated few diplomats. It's really bothering me, it's really stressing me out. All night, last night, I've been just calling, calling. There is no connections happening. To this morning, there's no connection. I don't even know whether they made it through or what happened as I speak to you. It's a terrible feeling. I send them text messages on Messenger, there's no response. According to statistics, Canada, around 17 and a half thousand Canadians identify as being from Sudanese origin. The Canadian government now says almost 1,600 Canadians are currently in Sudan. Many of them are being trapped by the fighting. The organization that represents Sudanese in Canada says the federal government must get involved diplomatically to end the conflict. Fair thing, of course, is... Uh requesting the Canadian government and the international com community at large to 
uh, mediate and stop the war. For now, Sunday Fanji can't reach his family, but is waiting to try and find out what happens. Since the war started, there is no way to send them money, so they can uh, move around, you know, or uh, or buy enough food to uh, to store at home. For Westman this week, I am Oluwakayodi. It's time for a short break, and when we come back, Lincoln Jordan is in with a look at international headlines. With your international wrap, I'm Lincoln Jordan. Here's what's making headlines around the world. 67 evacuees from Sudan arrived in Amman, the capital of Jordan, Tuesday evening. The majority are Jordanians, along with other nationals from Canada, Syria, Egypt, Iraq, the United States, Germany, the Netherlands, Norway, and Ethiopia. These evacuations come after several days of escalating violence across Sudan amid clashes between the Sudanese army and paramilitary forces. The number of people killed has risen to at least 459, and the number of injured reached over 4,000, according to the World Health Organization. In addition, Canada announced that it's completed its first evacuation flights Thursday. The government announced Wednesday that it will deploy up to 200 Canadian Armed Forces troops to assist with the evacuation. A member of Iran's Assembly of Experts, Ayatollah Abbas Ali Soleimani, was killed in a shooting attack in the city of Babalsar in northern Iran. Some Iranian state-affiliated media are calling the shooting an assassination. Three other people were injured in the attack. The incident reportedly took place at a bank. The gunman was immediately apprehended. Soleimani is part of the assembly that plays a role in selecting Iran's country's supreme leader. A New Zealand pilot, Philip Mertens, who's been held hostage since February by separatist fighters in Indonesia's Papua region, has surfaced in a video saying he's alive and well. Mertens said he was, quote, still alive, and called on authorities to stop ongoing airstrikes in the Induga Regency, which is where he's being held. The separatists have called on the New Zealand government to mediate and negotiate for Mertens' release. U.S. President Joe Biden formally announced his bid for re-election this past Tuesday, ending any lingering doubts about his intentions. In his video announcement, the president says next year's election is a fight against Republican extremism. The president enters the race with a significant legislative record, but low approval ratings. An NBC News poll conducted before Biden's announcement finds just 26% of Americans think Biden should run for a second term, and nearly half of those who oppose a Biden run say his age is a major reason. As of now, Biden's advisors say the president does not intend to hold re-election campaign rallies until Republicans have a presumptive nominee. Two British-based tobacco companies that allegedly sold their products to North Korea have reached a settlement with the Justice Department. British American Tobacco Marketing Singapore and its parent company, British American Tobacco, will pay the United States more than $600 million for violating U.S. sanctions policy against North Korea. British American Tobacco owns Lucky Strike, Dunhill, and other cigarette brands. Prosecutors allege the money from the tobacco sales helped fund North Korea's weapons programs. Pope Francis will allow women to participate and vote for the first time at an upcoming meeting of Catholic bishops in October. The meeting, known as a Synod, which is a gathering of bishops which takes place at the request of the Pope to discuss a particular topic, normally only allows bishops to vote. Pope Francis on Wednesday approved guidelines that will expand participation and voting to include lay people and women. Well, that's all the time we have for international headlines. Nicole, back to you. It's not unusual for food pictures and recipes to be shared on social media, but the latest craze making the rounds on TikTok is water recipes, adding flavored syrups and powders to water. 
Now, there's a lot of things to be interesting about drinking water, and in the today's Health Minute, Mandy Gaither gets a registered dietitian's take on what it's like to add syrups and powders to your water. Now, whether or not it is safe to stay hydrated, let's take a look. It may make drinking water easier for those who don't care for it. So water is very important, not just for hydration, but to be able to, um, you know, digest our food, have uh, regularity and things like that as well. The TikTok trend to add flavored syrups and powders to water can change how it tastes, but is it a healthy way to keep hydrated? Clinical dietitian Bridget Dewan with Orlando Health says it's important to listen to your thirst cues. We actually kind of talk about all fluid. So the goal is about 13 cups of fluid for adult males and about nine cups for adult females. And this includes all fluid. So we have to uh, factor in, yes, coffee counts, soda counts, juice counts. If you're swapping out soda for water with sugar-free syrups or powders, Dewan says that's a good substitution. However, drinking too many fluids can lead to low levels of sodium in your body and lead to a potentially dangerous condition called hyponatremia. Symptoms include nausea or vomiting, headache, confusion or fatigue, loss of energy, muscle weakness or cramps. Too much water is a bad thing, too little water is a bad thing. So it's a very good balance of what our body needs water for on a day-to-day -day basis. If you're switching up your hydration routine and have questions, Dewan says it's best to talk to your doctor or registered dietitian first. For Health Minute, I'm Mandy Gaither. Turning to sports, the Winnipeg Ice have advanced to the Eastern Conference Finals in the WHL playoffs. The team advanced after a dominant performance on Monday after beating the Moose Jaw Warriors. It was a strong 8-2 win to wrap up the series in six games. This is the second consecutive year that the Ice have reached the conference finals. Last year, they ran into a strong Edmonton Oil Kings team and the series ended in five games. Winnipeg is hoping for a different result. Winnipeg's opponent this year is the Saskatoon Blades. They are coming off a seven-game series thriller against the Red Deer Rebels. The Blades completed a reverse sweep after being down three games to nothing. The Blades will be a tough component for the ice. They finished second overall in the conference just behind Winnipeg. Game one is on Friday at six o'clock in Winnipeg. Moving over to the NHL, the Winnipeg Jets are facing elimination as they find themselves down three to one in the series to the Vegas Golden Knights. After starting out the series with a great game one performance, the Jets have dropped the last three straight games and now find themselves in a desperate push to claw their way back in tonight's game five matchup. It has been a series of hard-fought battles for the Jets, but not even the loud Winnipeg whiteout could slow down Vegas in games three and four. After losing a close double overtime thriller in game three, the Jets then dropped a hard-fought defensive contest in game four. Now, going into game five tonight, the team will be down two of their top guns as both defensemen Josh Morrissey and forward Mark Shiley are both done for the rest of the series. Forward Nikolai Ehlers' return to the lineup is still uncertain at this time, but he is listed as being potentially able to return tonight. Game 5 goes tonight in Las Vegas at 9 o'clock p.m. Over on the eastern side of the playoff bracket, the Toronto Maple Leafs are in a much different place. They have a 3-1 series lead against the Tampa Bay Lightning and also have a Game 5 matchup tonight. After winning back-to-back -back overtime in Games 3 and 4, the team will hope to slay their playoff demons tonight and win their first playoff series since 2004. Game 5 goes tonight in Toronto at 6 o'clock p.m.
taking a look at the current playoff bracket, there are a lot of teams that can deal the knockout blow in their next games. In the West, Seattle, Dallas, and Edmonton all have three to two series leads. And in the East, Boston and Carolina also have three to two series leads, while New Jersey and the New York Rangers remain the only series to be tied. And in our final look at sports, we see that hard work really does pay off. Sydney Houston takes us through the winners of ACC's Athletic Awards. The athletes of ACC had their awards banquet last week, honoring a season of hard work and growth. Starting strong are the athletes of the year. The Women's Athlete of the Year was awarded to number 14 on the women's hockey team, Simone Turner. The Male Athlete of the Year goes to number 8 on the men's soccer and futsal team, Theo Manias. Goalie Geneva Penner got the Coach's Award. Rookie Madison Hallia got the Most Improved. Emily Thompson received the Top Forward and Jensen Shearer with the Top Defense. And in men's futsal, Roberto Alonso was awarded the Most Improved, Gerardo Alas with the Coach's Award, and Theo Manias was awarded MVP for both futsal and soccer. Mikkel Boxhorn was awarded Soccer's Most Improved, and Depinder Singel got the Coach's Award for Soccer. For the women's volleyball team, number 6, 7, and 12 received awards. Janaea Schottbolt was awarded the Most Improved, L. Snyder took home the MVP, and Brooke Scoombart received the Coach's Award. In the women's futsal category, Valerie Carias was awarded the Most Improved, Tonielle Bashwich received MVP, and Jaspreet Verk took home the Coach's Award. In women's soccer, Kendra Manzoff was awarded the MVP, Hannah Hebert took home the Most Improved, and Madison Kilburn received the Coach's Award. That's a wrap for the 2022-2023 Athletic Awards. Recruiting for next season's new athletes has already begun. For us, Man This Week, I'm Sydney Houston. It's time for another break. When we come back, we will take a look at what's up this weekend. I'm Sydney Houston, and here's what's going on in Westman this weekend. Mecca Productions is putting on The Sound of Music. The musical runs from Thursday to Sunday at the WMCA. The show runs at 7.30 from Thursday to Saturday, and matinees are Saturday and Sunday at 2 p.m. Ticket prices for adults are $30, seniors and students are $25, and children under 12 are $20. You can buy tickets online or in person at the WMCA. The Evans Theatre is hosting the movie Ever Deadly. The film is based on the music and stories of Inuit singer Tanya Tagak. It weaves together concert footage and landscapes filled in Nunavut, telling stories and songs of pain, anger, and triumph. Shows are Friday through Sunday at 7.30 p.m. The Brandon Spring Craft Market is being held on Saturday at 10 a.m. at the Victoria Inn Hotel and Conference Center. Shop from over 30 Manitoba sellers. Admission is $2. Kids 12 and under get in for free. If dancing is your thing, Lady of the Lake has flamenco on the prairies. The group performs flamenco music and Brazilian jazz. That takes place 9 to 11 on Friday. Tickets are 10 bucks. On Saturday, the United Way is holding Brandon's largest garage sale. The event runs 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. at the Keystone Center. Admission is $2. Children 12 and under get in for free, and tables to rent are $30. Dust the clubs off and head outside. Shiloh Country Club is officially open for season. Tea times are available for booking by calling the Pro Shop. Tangle Box returns to the 40. The band plays classics, new rock, and a little bit of country. You can join them Friday and Saturday night. Tickets are $10 at the door. You must be 18 and older, and photo ID is required. So let's see how the weather is going to be for your weekend. We are certainly hoping the snowy days are behind us. Friday will be a mix of sun and clouds with a high of 11 and low of 1. 
Saturday is sunny with a high of 14 and low of minus 2. Sunday will be a mix of sun and cloud with a high of 12 and low of minus 3. So it looks like the warmer weather is finally on the way. That's it for Westman this weekend. I'm Sydney Houston. Back to you, Nicole. For fans of local musical theater, Mecca Productions is putting on The Sound of Music on the stage at the Westennial, Westman Centennial Auditorium. There is a lot of work to put on a show like this. Carson Rice gives us the inside scoop. Oh, oh, dear. The Sound of Music is a household name when discussing musicals, says one of many cast members who are partaking in this week's show that's being put on by Mecca Productions from April 27th to the 30th. It's been 17 years since they last performed this musical, and the directors say it's about time they brought it back. One of the directors also says that their performances are not only great for the audience, but have unique benefits towards the performers. It's great for the audience that comes because it's really uplifting and empowering and it feels great when you leave. You're singing a song that you probably know or more than one, but it's really good for the people that are involved behind the scenes too. It takes a lot of effort and a lot of time, but it really helps build a strong community, the people that care about each other. So yeah, there's lots of benefit to it. The three-hour production will also include a 16-piece live orchestra, which ran the company an extra $3,500 for the week. The orchestra includes a mix of community and university musicians. Since this side of the company that handles the major productions is a non-profit, their main goal when coming to money is just breaking even. Mecca's productions typically cost around forty to fifty thousand dollars, and one of their biggest costs is renting out the Westman Centennial Auditorium, which is upwards of twelve grand. For Westman this week, I'm Carson Rice. A younger generation and illegal foreign fishing boats are just two of the new wrinkles in a long-running reality series set off the coast of Alaska. Alaska. David Daniel has a look in today's Hollywood Minute. Fishermen are always on the front lines. This is about defending our grounds, no matter what. The new season of Deadliest Catch is underway. Illegal fishing prompted by soaring Alaskan crab prices is making the work even more dangerous, prompting older and younger captains in the competitive industry to work together to a point. Normally it's all the old timers wanting to stick to themselves and the young guns working really hard to outbeat you guys, but this year we actually did work together. And why should I give my secrets away to some young guy? I mean, come on, I earned it. Well, we want to keep long the time. fisheries going. Who do you think is going to take over? I even lie to you if I have to. I'm not just going to hand over the silver platter. <laughs> you don't just take the throne. It doesn't work that way. The 19th season of Deadliest Catch is now playing on Discovery Channel and Discovery Plus. Staying dry in Hollywood, I'm David Daniel. From a moose at the movies to handguns down under and geo storms lighting up the sky, We've got it all for you in today's Take a Look at This. A theater in Kenai, Alaska had a unique visitor last week when a moose wandered in to see what was playing. He must be a movie bull. But instead of enjoying the latest Matt Damon flick, he sauntered over to the popcorn and helped himself to the salty snack for nearly five minutes, much to the amusement and I'll bet nervousness of the staff. Once he was done, they were able to coax the mammoth muncher back outside. But the most impressive part of this video is how well this wild animal minds the stanchions. Honestly, better than most humans I've seen. And coming up in today's episode of World's Most Unsavvy Travelers, a 28-year-old woman was arrested in Sydney, Australia after arriving in the country with a handgun. And not just any handgun, a 24-karat gold-plated handgun. The woman had the firearm in her luggage when she arrived over the weekend from LAX, authorities said. And in case you didn't know, Australia has some of the strictest laws on gun ownership in the world. According to the Australian Border Force, the passenger did not have a permit to possess or import a firearm in the country. She faces up to 10 years in prison if convicted. Crikey! The Northern Lights put on quite the show this weekend with several sightings over North America. In Minnesota, professional astrophotographer Jacob Schlichter captured the solar flare that set off a geomagnetic storm that lit up the sky in an array of colors. 
suddenly everything is dancing just above me and it was like super magical. On this same night over in Maine, the National Weather Service in Caribou captured the stunners of the Aurora Borealis showing off over the far northeast coast of the U.S. According to Space Weather Watch, as many as 30 states had a chance to catch Sunday's light show. For a Take a Look at This, I'm Cole Higgins. That's all the time we have for today's program. This is our final show of the year and it has been an incredible season. There has been a lot of hard work and it's been lots of fun bringing you the local stories. From all of us here at the studio, I'm Nicole Ruth. Thanks for watching.